Hello, this is Professor Ryan Paul, and this is a discussion of books one through six of Homer's Odyssey. I'll give you a brief overview of some important issues, talk about some of the major plot points of the first six books, and provide some questions for further consideration. We might call the Odyssey the sequel to the Iliad. In the Iliad, we talk uh, about the Trojan War, or rather one section of the Trojan War, and the Odyssey tells the story of Odysseus and his journeys as the last of the Greek heroes to find his way home after that conflict. Uh, and one important difference to think about in terms of the Odyssey and the Iliad, whereas the Iliad's main focus is violence, war, and the theme of heroic revenge, the Odyssey, in many ways, focuses on more domestic matters, family, the relationships between husband and wife, and parents and children, and issues of lineage and so forth. Ancient literary critics called the narrative style of the Odyssey, as well as the Iliad, in media res, which is a Latin phrase meaning in the middle of things. And this was considered to be a better narrative structure. It begins at the height of the action. So rather than starting all the way back at the end of the Trojan War with Odysseus first setting out and then recounting all of his journey, it begins after he's already been lost for many years, at the very height of the action when he's just about to return or just about to begin his final leg of his journey home. And then it moves backwards to cover earlier events, to recount what has led up to the battle. So in media res, and it's something that you'll see in many poems that follow, uh, and many narratives that follow Homer's style. Being that this is a travel narrative, there have been many attempts since antiquity to attempt to map out Odysseus's travels. But while some things can be, some places can be located, ultimately it's impossible to get a fully accurate map because Homer's geography, as described in the Odyssey, is not exactly accurate. It's not correct. Um, in terms of describing the Aegean Sea, that is the sea that uh, is between Turkey, modern-day Turkey, and modern-day Greece, he's basically familiar with that area. But there are more distant locations described, and they're very vague on their details, and sometimes, in fact, contradictory in terms of how he describes certain places. Uh, and this is probably because he was basing his tale on legends that are that we don't have uh, contemporary copies of, but legends of other travelers that he mixed together in crafting his narrative. For example, here is one map that attempts to plot out Homer's uh, description of Odysseus's travels. The line in red, beginning all the way over in Troy on the uh, roughly the left side of the map, uh, maps out where he traveled, leaving Troy until his shipwreck on Calypso's Island, which is located all the way at the Straits of Gibraltar between North Africa and Spain. And then we see him traveling back and ultimately returning to Ithaca. So here's one uh, scholar's attempt to map out Odysseus's travels. Here we see a slightly different map, which, as you can see, doesn't go all the way as far to the west. It locates Calypso's island uh, much closer in the Mediterranean Sea, just uh, between Sicily and um, North Africa at number 14. So here's a different map. It matches in certain aspects, but it's not nearly as complex uh, or nearly as far flung in terms of its attempt to discover Odysseus's route. And here's a third map just for comparison's sake, not quite as, covering quite as large an area as the first one, but a little bit more uh, dispersed than the second map, um, with Calypso's Island being, uh, I believe, number 12 on the far left corner, uh, and of course beginning at number one on the far right corner with Troy. So as we can see, these are very different maps. There are some areas that they have in common, but ultimately, again, it's really impossible to say um, where Odysseus would have traveled, where these places were, and if Homer was actually attempting to construct a realistic map that matched the actual geography of the area. Now, when we consider Odysseus himself, he is a hero. He is the hero of this uh, poem, and he was revered and considered a great hero in Greek tradition. But what does it mean to be a hero? Well, he was a great warrior, of course, and a beloved king. His people worshipped him. 
But unlike Achilles, who is the hero of the Iliad, Odysseus is a much more crafty character. Achilles hates lying, we learn in the Iliad, and we see also in the Odyssey when Odysseus beats, visits him in the underworld. But Odysseus is an inveterate and very skilled liar, and he does so in order to achieve his, his ends. He's noted as being crafty, a persuasive speaker, and again, skilled at deception. And even when he's not outright lying, we see often throughout the poem that he's very careful in what he says and how he presents himself. And so this is a different idea from our modern understanding of what a hero would be. It shows that deception is not really considered in itself an immoral act only when it's used for evil pursuits. Odysseus is praised because he's such a good deceiver. He's such a good trickster. Uh, however, on the other hand, much like Achilles, what they share is that Odysseus is also vengeful and proud. Uh, as we'll see at the end of the poem, he brutally slays all of the suitors who are pursuing his wife without any sense of pity or remorse. And again, this is considered to be acceptable. This is not wrong. There's no real moral question about this act. It's just part of what it meant to be a great warrior. So this leads us to consider the wider society and the codes of conduct that governed how people interacted or were supposed to interact in this society. As we see throughout the Odyssey, honor and respect are very important. One is expected to pay due deference to one's elders, to the great, to those who are of higher status. And this is an extremely important ethical consideration. Does one show due deference or do they speak rudely? Do they speak above their, their station and defy those who are owed respect? Another related virtue is that of hospitality. We must consider that this was a world in, in reality that was very harsh. There is no real international law or anything like that. So traveling was extremely dangerous. Thus hospitality is a very important virtue. As we'll see throughout the Odyssey, uh, the great lords and kings are respected and praised for how they treat those who visit them, the strangers, Telemachus, Odysseus, and others who visit them. It's the host's duty to welcome visitors warmly and to give them gifts, to show them that you are a welcoming person. This both showed your generosity as well as your goodness. And so this exchange of gifts that we see quite often, for example, Nestor and Menelaus both give gifts to uh, Telemachus. It's a means of establishing friendship, a means of showing establishing bonds of loyalty, as well as a means of showing one's greatness, one's generosity, that you can give away lavish wealth to those who visit you. And another just notable uh, important code of conduct or, or detail that we see is that public displays of emotion are expected and welcomed. We see that many heroes, including Odysseus himself, weep openly when they talk of their griefs and their sufferings, and they tell of their many sorrows and trials. Very different from modern expectations that a strong man keeps everything bottled up. The public display of emotion was a sign also of one's great heartedness, that one could weep, that one could uh, express one's suffering openly, was in fact something to be praised um, or, and respected. Much like in the Iliad, the gods play a very important role in the Odyssey. And these are recognizably anthropomorphic gods. That means human-shaped, quite literally. They are recognizably human in their behavior, they are human in their desires, and they are human in their flaws and limitations. And as we see throughout the poem, they are closely involved in human affairs. However, unlike the god of the Judeo-Christian tradition, who is a god of goodness, a god that enforces right, a god that is said to love his chosen people, the gods of the ancient Greeks, uh, as Homer presents them, are not concerned with right or wrong as much as they are concerned with their own honor, their own reputation, and their own pleasures. And unfortunately for humans, that means that oftentimes when the gods intervene, uh, the humans end up suffering for it and bad things happen to them for no real fault of their own. One of the reasons why humans tend to suffer so much because of the gods is because the gods have their own conflicts amongst themselves. 
as we saw, one of the root causes of the Trojan War was Hera and Athena's anger and their desire to be revenged on Troy for Paris judging them less beautiful than Aphrodite. So the conflict between the gods often uh, ends up costing the humans who are caught in the crossfire. However, we rarely see the gods fight directly. They don't often engage in out-and-out -out conflict with one another. Um, usually, if one of them is in, if there is a danger of such conflict, or if one of them is in danger of being dishonored, uh, another will step aside. Usually, their conflicts are much more through backroom dealings, through indirect means such as their manipulation of humans and human events, uh, but not so much out-and-out -out con uh, conflict. And perhaps most disturbing to our sense, to the modern sense of what a god should be, we see that these gods, again, behave with little concern for any human concept of justice, or really any concept of justice at all, again, besides their own pleasure and their own sense of uh, self-esteem or reputation. For example, the Phaeacians, who are very admirable in their hospitality towards Odysseus, exactly what they should do, are punished by Poseidon, even though they also pay much due respect and deference to Poseidon. He punishes them brutally. And Zeus, rather than protecting them, even though he is known as the protector of suppliants and wanderers and strangers, he allows this to happen. He doesn't raise any fuss over Poseidon's actions just because he wants to make sure that Poseidon's honor and prestige is saved. So these are not gods, as Homer presents them, that we can look to for transcendent ideals of right and wrong. They are, much like humans, petty and flawed, just with much greater power. One last important uh, topic to talk about, although there are many others that we could address, is that of gender and uh, the relationship between men and women. Unlike the Iliad, which is a world at war, the Odyssey is a world largely at peace. That's not to say it's perfect, but this is, we see people at peace. We see people at, in their homes, which means, narratively speaking, there's a much greater role for women. Again, one of the reasons why some people theorize that Homer may have actually been a woman. And there are many powerful women, both divine and human. Of course, there's Athena uh, and Calypso, two goddesses with great um, power over Odysseus's life but also human women like Penelope, Odysseus's long-suffering wife, and Nausicaa and Arete, uh, the princess and queen of the Phaeacians, respectively, who, as we'll see in uh, the early parts of the Odyssey, play an important role in rescuing and saving Odysseus. So women play roles as both helpers and as temptations. Um, there's also very complex interactions between men and women. We might expect a, a very one-way kind of relationship because the men are socially superior and have more authority. However, as you'll see repeatedly, women exercise a great deal of authority in this poem, as they did in real life, even in a patriarchal society, and sometimes they even countered or uh, prevailed upon men even though the men might have differed with their opinions or desires. So gender is a very important topic to consider and to think about what we learn about Greek society and Greek notions of masculinity and femininity as you read this poem. So now I will go into a brief overview of books one through six, highlighting some of the most important moments, not everything, of course, not every detail, but some of the key moments in the text uh, with the idea of raising some important issues and themes. I will provide some quotations as, as well, and these are all from the translation that I am using, the one by Robert Fagels. It begins, as do all poems of antiquity, with the traditional invocation to the muses, the call to the divine muses to inspire the poet with the words to sing. Sing to me of the man, muse, the man of twists and turns, driven time and again off course, once he had plundered the hallowed halls of Troy. So it tells us of the subject that we're going to learn of the man of twists and turns, that is, the cunning and crafty Odysseus, 
but he is also a man of twists and turns in that his own path has been twisted and turned as he's, again, driven off course over and over again after his uh, victory at the Trojan War. We learn that Odysseus has been held captive on the Isle of Calypso for many years because of Poseidon's lingering anger. That Poseidon is angry that Odysseus blinded his son, the Cyclops Polyphemus, and we'll learn much later in the Odyssey of this actual story. And Athena, or Pallas Athena, as she's called, uh, takes pity on him. She takes pity on Odysseus, who suffered for long, so long, and while Poseidon is away, she goes to Zeus and urges him to allow Odysseus to return to Ithaca. So we see the gods politicking behind each other's back. She doesn't defy Poseidon openly. She waits until he's gone to Ethiopia uh, before she asks Zeus to help Odysseus. And Zeus, even though he is the king of the gods, says, but come, all of us here, put heads together now. Work out his journey home so Odysseus can return. Lord Poseidon, I trust, will let his anger go. How can he stand his ground against the will of all the gods at once, one god alone? So even though Zeus is the most powerful of the gods and the king of the gods, even he doesn't want to defy the great Poseidon, his brother, uh, without help, without getting the agreement of all the other gods on his side. Athena goes to Ithaca, Odysseus's land, and visits his son Telemachus. And Telemachus, as we learn, has been consumed with grief for years because of his father's long absence, he presumes Odysseus is dead, but also because of the suitors who have besieged his, his palace for years and years, pursuing his mother Penelope, Odysseus's wife, attempting to get her to marry him, marry one of them. Uh, and they've been eating all of his food, spending his money, and basically eating him out of house and home. Athena comes in disguise. She visits and presents herself as a great male warrior. And we see when Telemachus sees her, he glimpsed Athena now, and straight to the porch he went, mortified that a guest might still be standing at the doors. Then he escorted her to a high, elaborate chair of honor. So we see Telemachus paying his due deference to Athena as a visitor. In her guise, as this visiting warrior, Athena says, I think Odysseus is still alive. She tells that to Telemachus, and she says, you should call upon the lords of Ithaca and the suitors and ask the lords to help you displace the suitors, demand that the suitors leave. And you should also go on a quest, look for news of your father, search out word, and find out whether or not he's really alive or dead. We see an interesting moment between Telemachus and his mother Penelope. There's a bard, Phemius, and he sings a song of the Achaeans, that is the Greeks, journeying home from Troy. And it tells of all the sufferings of the, the various uh, travelers as they attempted to return home from Troy. When Penelope hears this, of course, she finds herself filled with sorrow. But break off the song, the unendurable song that always rends the heart inside of me. So we have this wonderful moment where we see Penelope's pain at hearing of these tales that remind her of her own loss and her lost husband. But Telemachus rebukes her. Why fault the bard? Courage, mother. Harden your heart and listen. Go back to your quarters. Tend to your own tasks. So an interesting conflict between son and mother, between male and female, and their different attitudes towards Odysseus's loss. We also see Telemachus rebuke the suitors. He says, leave, stop eating me out of house and home, stop eating all our food, spending all our money, using up all my inheritance. But the suitors defy him. They say, we're not gonna listen to you, boy and it's not up to you what's gonna happen. One of us is going to wed your mother, so you need to tell her to pick one. So the suitors we see have no concern for Tele Telemachus. They don't take him seriously. Some questions to consider when thinking about book one. First, how does Telemachus display his worthiness and his good breeding? How does he show us, how do we see early on in this narrative that Telemachus is a good prince, that he is worthy of Odysseus's, uh, that he's a worthy son and heir to Odysseus. What do we see about the gods? 
for example, the interaction between Athena and Zeus, what does it tell us about the gods, how Homer and his culture viewed them, what the gods represented to them, and how their relationships between the gods and between the gods and humans might have been used to express Greek understandings of their own nature and the politics of humanity. And just some other questions about the characters. How are the suitors described? How are they characterized? What are their notable traits? What do we see in their behavior? And similarly, what do we learn about Penelope? What do we think about her? How is she described by the narrator of this poem? Book two, Telemachus sets sail. It begins with a formulaic op opening when young dawn with her rose red fingers shone once more. And we'll see variations on that formula throughout the poem whenever there's daybreak. Uh, at the beginning of the book, Telemachus calls upon the lords of Ithaca and the suitors. And he displays openly his grief at the way the suitors behave. He weeps openly over their um, uh, disrespect of his home, and he condemns his fellow lords of Ithaca for not coming to his aid. The lords and the suitors uh, respond to Telemachus, and again, some of the lords respect Telemachus, but the suitors largely once more just uh, disrespect him. And one, Antinous, blames Penelope. She says, "Blame." He says, "Don't blame us. Blame your mother for toying with us." Remember how she spent three years weaving and then at night secretly unweaving her web, saying, once I finish this, I'll marry one of you. But then every night she would unweave it. She's been toying with us. So if you really want us out of here, you need to demand that your mother goes back to her home, goes back to her parents, and then picks one of us to marry. But Telemachus says, and this is, again, a, a notable uh, moment for the way it talks, shows us the relationship between men and women in Greek culture. Antinous, how can I drive my mother from our house against her will? The one who bore me, reared me too. So despite his earlier rebuke of his mother, Telemachus also pays her proper respect as the woman who raised him. In the course of this book, Telemachus is visited again by Athena in the form of mentor, his father's aid, and she says, let's go, let's set sail and go find news of your father. And she says, again, in the form of mentor, that she'll gather ships and men for their journey. Telemachus, when he announces his plans, is mocked by the suitors, who don't, again, they don't take him seriously, they just consider him a young boy. And in another notable domestic moment, in a very personal, intimate moment, we see Telemachus's interaction with Eurycleia, an old maid, uh, a servant to the house, a woman who's been there for many generations, and she begs Telemachus not to leave. She worries about him. She worries what will happen to this boy who she has helped raise since his infancy. Um, and in turn, Telemachus says, don't tell my mother that I've gone. And then the, po uh, the book ends with Athena, in the form of mentor, setting sail for Sparta with Telemachus. Some questions to consider about book two. What do we see about Telemachus as a public speaker and what makes him a good speaker? You might keep this in mind when we compare him to his father, when we see his father speak publicly later in the poem. How do the suitors behave towards Telemachus? What do they say to him? And what does it reveal about their character, their attitudes, their beliefs? And finally, what do you make of the scene between Telemachus and Eurycleia and Telemachus' request that she doesn't tell his mother? Again, why is this important as a narrative? Why is it perhaps surprising in an epic poem about heroes and gods that we have this domestic, intimate moment? Book three, King Nestor Remembers. 
Uh, Nestor, as we you might remember, is one of the heroes from the Iliad. And in the Iliad, he was uh, known as the oldest of the, of the Greek heroes and the most wise. He was respected by all of the Greek heroes for his great wisdom. And he's frequently given the epithet of breaker of horses. That is someone who trains horses, who breaks them in, who can take the wild stallion and domesticate it. So it speaks of his great power over nature. Telemachus and Athena, who is again disguised as mentor, they arrive in the city that Nestor rules, Pylos, his capital city. And we see a, a very human moment for the young Telemachus. He fears going before this great king, Nestor. He says, how can I greet him, mentor, even approach the king? I'm hardly adept at subtle conversation. Someone my age might feel shy, what's more, interrogating an older man. Despite Telemachus's fears, however, they receive a warm welcome. Athena, and that is mentor, disguised, Athena disguised as mentor, and Telemachus receive a warm welcome when they arrive at Nestor's palace. And Nestor's eldest son, Pisistratus, welcomes them and, um, in fact, shows deference to mentor as the older of the two, gives him first a gold wine cup to drink from before he gives it to Telemachus. And as we see, Athena, Pallas Athena, is overjoyed at this. She is very happy at Pisistratus' behavior. Uh, and quote, it says, And Pallas rejoiced at the prince's sense of tact in giving the gold wine cup first to her. Because, of course, again, she's described as mentor, an older man. For his part, King Nestor um, warmly remembers Odysseus and praises him, as well as his son Telemachus. He says, and no one there could hope to rival Odysseus, not for sheer cunning. At every twist of strategy, he excelled us all. Your father, yes, if you are in fact his son. I look at you and a sense of wonder takes me. Your way with words, it's just like his. I'd swear no youngster could ever speak like you, so apt, so telling. So we see that despite his fears, Telemachus is, in fact, a very good speaker, and he reminds Nestor of his great father, the cunning uh, and brilliant and crafty Odysseus. We get here one of the first um, accounts in the poem of what happened to the other Achaeans, the other Greeks in the aftermath of the Trojan War. Nestor tells what he knows about what happened to them. Um, and he talks about a number of them, including Odysseus, Ajax, and so forth. But we get here a mention of Agamemnon, who'd been mentioned earlier, who again was the uh, mightiest in terms of the most powerful and wealthiest of the Greek heroes that besieged Troy. And we, we are reminded once more that Agamemnon, despite his great wealth and power, was murdered upon arriving back home uh, by his wife Clytemnestra, who had taken a, a new lover, Aegisthus. And, uh, however, after Agamemnon's murder, his son Orestes avenged his death by killing Aegisthus as well as his mother, his own mother Clytemnestra. So this is mentioned again, and it will come up uh, repeatedly again in this poem. Telemachus, hearing this story, which of course he knows, says, If only the gods would arm me in such power, I'd take revenge on the lawless, brazen suitors riding roughshod over me, plotting reckless outrage. So Telemachus wishes he could be like Orestes and avenge his father and slay the suitors, but he is not powerful enough. He is just a young man. Nestor also talks a bit about Menelaus, that is the king of Sparta and Agamemnon's brother, and of course the husband of Helen. Uh, he talks about how Menelaus was delayed on the seas, was lost for years traveling, and because he was away for so long, he could neither save his brother nor avenge his brother Agamemnon, something that, as we'll see in the next uh, book, uh, pains Menelaus greatly. As befits a good king, Nestor is quite hospitable. He gives a great deal to Telemachus. He allows Telemachus to stay in his palace and gives him many lavish gifts of gold and silver and so forth, and a, a number of powerful horses and chariots with which to travel to Sparta. And his eldest son, Pisistratus, goes with them as they travel across land to now visit Menelaus. 
So some questions to consider about book three. What important social values are displayed in this episode, in all the interactions between Telemachus and Nestor, and of course, the, the other family members of Nestor? Um, what do we see about the social codes? How do we see them enacted in this book? Um, and how do the characters, Nestor, Telemachus, Pisistratus, and others, how do they distinguish themselves as noble and worthy? Why do we know, as an audience, that these are good people and great heroes to be honored. And why do you think Agamemnon's story is mentioned again here, and as it will be multiple times again in this poem? What is it, how does it serve as a parallel or contrast with the story of Odysseus and Telemachus? And thinking about it narratively, how does it serve to spur Telemachus himself? What effect does hearing this story have on Telemachus? Book four, the king and queen of Sparta. So after leaving Nestor's city, Telemachus and Pisistratus, Nestor's eldest son, travel across land and they arrive in Sparta, where Menelaus rules. And Menelaus, again, as befits a good king, warmly welcomes them to his palace, saying, just think of all the hospitality we enjoyed at the hands of other men before we made it home. And God save us from such hard treks in years to come. Quick, unhitch their team and bring them in, strangers, guests, to share our flowing feast. So he, he expresses one of the reasons why hospitality was so important. Others gave us hospitality, and God forbid, if this happens to us, that people don't treat us well. That if we once more have to travel, that we get treated harshly, so we give to others in order that we may be treated warmly ourselves and to pay back what others have in the past given us. As we see, Menelaus is extremely wealthy, and as he himself says, probably one of the wealthiest men in all the world, partially because he has not only his own wealth, but that of much of that of his brother Agamemnon. And he showers Telemachus and Pisistratus with food and drink and gifts. And Telemachus is overwhelmed by how wealthy and generous Menelaus is. He says, surely Zeus's court on Olympus must be just like this. The boundless glory of all this wealth inside. My eyes dazzle. I am struck with wonder. So we see Menelaus's, uh, we see just how impressive Menelaus is, another thing that adds to his glory and that Telemachus recognizes. Even before Menelaus has fully recognized Telemachus or Telemachus has revealed himself as Odysseus's son, he announces how much he grieves for Odysseus more than any others who, who left for even his own brother uh, after the Trojan War because Odysseus suffered more than any others. And both he and his wife Helen recognize who Telemachus is. They say, this is the son of Odysseus. And when this is unveiled, Menelaus says, wonderful, the red-haired king cried out, the son of my dearest friend here in my own house. So he's greatly honored that he can give gifts, that he can uh, host his best friend's son. And all of them weep together over the lost and the dead. Helen, Menelaus, and Telemachus all cry until Helen puts a soothing drug in their wine that helps them to ease their pain and forget their sorrows. And both Helen and Menelaus talk about Odysseus and Troy. Helen recounts how Odysseus snuck into the city and she recognized him and even bathed him. But for some reason, she says she did not reveal him to the Trojans because of how much she, re re she respected Odysseus. And Menelaus also recounts how Odysseus saved them. While he and the other Greeks were in the Trojan horse, Helen came around and imitated the voices of their wives saying, come out, come out, husband, it's me. Uh, and they all wanted to go out because apparently they're idiots. But Odysseus said, no, 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 don't go out. He held them back. And because of this, he saved them all and thus enabled their victory over Troy. As we found out from Nestor, Menelaus had been lost for many years at sea. And he recounts his tale, how he was shipwrecked in Egypt 
because he didn't make the proper sacrifices. And while he's there, uh, the daughter of Proteus, one of the gods, Proteus, who is the old man of the sea, uh, his daughter Adotheia takes pity on Menelaus and she says, look, if you want to get out of here, you have to capture my father. You have to wrestle my father, the god Proteus, and force him to help you escape. So she tells him how and, and helps them to capture and wrestle Proteus. And once they do, Proteus says, okay, well, if you want to get out of here, what you need to do is make a sacrifice to Zeus because you forgot to do that. But he also tells him about all the others. He tells him about his brother Agamemnon's death and the fates of the other Greeks and how Odysseus was lost at sea. And once more, Menelaus displays his generosity and wealth by offering many rich gifts to Telemachus, including a number of great stallions. Telemachus says, I appreciate that, but I really can't take these horses. I can't take them on my ship back to Ithaca. And after all, Ithaca isn't uh, the proper island, isn't the proper land for horses. But thank you for the other gifts. So we see this exchange, this hospitality, and the bond it creates, which is more than just a personal thing, which is more than just relationships between two individuals, but is a political bond as well between two noble houses, between two families of rulers. After all of this uh, warm hospitality, we end the book on a rather ominous note. We go back to Ithaca, where we see that the suitors who have found that Telemachus has left are worried about what might happen. So they plot to ambush him and murder him on his way home. Penelope learns of this and, of course, is very worried for her son. She weeps um, and worries about her son's possible death. But Athena sends a spirit to comfort Penelope, says, don't worry, everything will be okay. So a few questions to think about for book four. Um, how is it that Menelaus and Helen recognize Telemachus? How do they know he's the son of Odysseus? What is it about Telemachus that signals his heritage? And what do Menelaus and Helen in their tales, what do they reveal about Odysseus's character? What do we learn about him? who he was, what kind of person he was, his craftiness, his wisdom, and why he was so respected and honored. And what do we see again about the gods and their interaction with humans? Um, Proteus and Menelaus, for example, a, an interesting and rather strange moment where a human manages to wrestle a god and capture him. Or Pallas sending the spirit to comfort Athena. What does this show us again about Greek ideas of the gods and the supernatural and how the supernatural world affected and impinged upon the human world. Book five, Odysseus, Nymph and Shipwreck, we finally see Odysseus himself. And we learn that he has been on the island of Calypso, a goddess, serving as her unwilling lover for seven years. And although she offers him immortality and, and provides for him uh, and, and makes love to him every evening, he weeps every day and wishes to return home. Um, Athena, goes to Zeus once more and says, please protect Telemachus and make Calypso release Odysseus. And Zeus uh, agrees and sends Hermes to give his decree to Calypso to say, look, it's time for you to let Odysseus go. Hermes arrives and tells Calypso, it's time for you to let Odysseus go, and she's not happy about this. She says, I've treated him so well, I've offered him immortality, I've given him ambrosia, the food of the gods. And she says to, to Hermes, hard-hearted you are, you gods, you unrivaled lords of jealousy, scandalized when goddesses sleep with mortals openly, even when one has made the man her husband. This is a really interesting moment, and think about this. Think what you know about Zeus and his romantic adventures, and what is it that Calypso is saying here? 
about the gods and their hypocrisy. Why is this such a striking moment? Again, considering uh, notions of gender, and how is this perhaps unexpected in an epic story about heroic men and warriors? Again, Odysseus has been suffering his entire time with Calypso. She's even offered him immortality, but he refused. Very unusual, in fact, unheard of in any other myths uh, of the Greeks and Romans. And it, we learn just how painful his time has been. In the nights, true, he'd sleep with her in the arching cave. He had no choice. Unwilling lover alongside lover, all too willing. But all his days he'd sit on the rocks and beaches, wrenching his heart with sobs and groans and anguish, gazing out over the barren sea through blinding tears. So just a reminder, right? We see Odysseus suffering openly, weeping. This isn't the strong, silent type who keeps it all held in. He's a great hero. He's a great warrior. And with that comes great passion, great suffering. A very different idea of masculinity, perhaps, than modern notions of what a man should be. So Calypso says, I'm going to set you free, Odysseus. I'm even going to help you go home. But at first, Odysseus doesn't exactly trust her. He thinks that it's another trick to make him suffer more. And she says, no, this is no trick. I'm going to help you. But just so you know, you should stay here because things are going to get worse before they get better. You're going to have a lot more pain on your way home. But Odysseus says, and if a god will wreck me yet again on the wine dark sea, I can bear that too with the spirit tempered to endure. Much have I suffered, labored long and hard by now in the waves and wars. Add this to the total, bring the trial on. So despite the fact that Odysseus weeps openly and suffers, he is not a weak man. Again, his great suffering is matched by his great endurance and great strength. He's ready to suffer more, and he would rather suffer more if it meant the possibility of going home rather than taking the easy way and immortality with Calypso. So Odysseus builds a raft and sets sail with a number of provisions from Calypso. Uh, but Poseidon, who is now on his way back from Ethiopia, sees Odysseus sailing, and he is not happy about this. He realizes that he's been tricked, that the other gods have betrayed him behind his back and let Odysseus go free. So he decides to cause a great storm and send it upon Odysseus, hoping that this will drown him once and for all. But Odysseus is saved by the goddess Leucothea, uh, who sees him... Uh, struggling in the ocean, as well as Athena, and they both help him survive the great storm. And he washes ashore on Phaeacia, uh, a great seafaring nation and a nation devoted to Poseidon. So some questions about book five to consider. What, again, is significant about Calypso's response to Hermes? What is the hypocrisy of the gods that she's calling out? Why is this such an important moment in terms of a very, uh, a much more nuanced and subtle understanding of gender, of women's experience? What might Homer be reflecting about the real experiences of women and what it's like to be a woman in a male-dominated society? What is Odysseus's mistrust of Calypso and the other gods reveal about his character? What does it show us about him and how does it fit into what we know about his personality? Of course, we, we might see he's basically right. He says the gods are going to do something more to me, and he's right. As soon as he sets sail, Poseidon punishes him. Uh, and finally, why does Zeus require that Odysseus still suffer through his trials on the way home? She says, uh, Zeus says, I'm not just going to send him home easily. He's going to have to suffer more. Why? And why don't Athena and Calypso offer more direct help? Why do they do so indirectly? Again, what is Homer showing us here about the Greek philosophy of life and what life was like and what one had to do in life and deal with in life?
Book six, The Princess and the Stranger. So now we're in Phaeacia, and Odysseus has been washed ashore and lays unconscious on the beach. Athena goes to Nausicaa, the beautiful daughter of the king of Phaeacia, King Alcinous, described often as the white-armed daughter. And Nausicaa, in her sleep, is given a dream by Athena, where she's inspired, because she is a virgin, because she is unmarried, to go out to the washing pools to bathe herself, to prepare herself, hopefully, to find a husband, because she is a beautiful and much desired woman. So when she awakes, Nausicaa says, let's go out to the springs, let's bathe ourselves. And so she and her maids go travel out there um, to bathe and enjoy themselves. While the girls are playing, splashing about in the springs, throwing a ball back and forth, Odysseus is awakened by the noise. And we see immediately um, both just how the suffering that he's been through has affected him, as well as his still cunning and craftiness and his uh, intelligence in terms of how he encounters these strangers. He says to himself, man of misery, whose land have I lit on now? What are they here, violent, savage, lawless? or friendly to strangers, God-fearing men. We see the very real uh, fear that any traveler might have coming to a new land. What kind of people have I come across? Are these good people or will they, will they take me in or will they murder me? Muttering so, great Odysseus crept out of the bushes, stripping off with his massive hand a leafy branch from the tangled olive growth to shield his body, hide his private parts. And out he stalked as a mountain lion exultant at his power, a terrible sight, all crusted, caked with brine. They scattered in panic down the jutting beaches. Nausicaa, however, does not flee like her maids do. She is given bravery by Athena, and she stands before Odysseus. And we see another wonderful moment of Odysseus's internal narrative where he says, how should I approach this woman? Should I grab her knees and prostrate myself before her? Or should I stand back and praise her? What should I do? So he decides to stand back and, and praise her and say, are you some beautiful goddess? Who are you? So he pleads with her for help, and because of his words, again, his persuasive speech and his intelligence, Nausicaa recognizes this is not just some monster, or some gross guy, this is not some pirate or some violent savage, this is a worthy man. And she decides to offer her aid. Uh, Odysseus accepts it, and again, another wonderful and very human moment, he says, well, I'm going to bathe myself, but I don't want to do it in front of these young girls. I'm too modest. I don't want to scandalize them. So he goes off to bathe himself out of their view. And when Odysseus comes out after bathing and dressing himself, um, Athena enhances his beauty, makes him taller, makes him glisten uh, in the sun, makes him look even more powerful and handsome than he had before. And so Nausicaa, seeing him, says, as we might expect a young unmarried girl who is very desirous of a husband to say, she says, at first he seemed appalling, I must say. Now he seems like a god who rules the skies up there. Ah, if only a man like that were called my husband, lived right here, pleased to stay forever. So a wonderfully human moment, uh, this internal dialogue of Nausicaa, who sees this beautiful, handsome man and knows, well, this isn't the man for me, but boy, I wish I could find a man like that. Finally, book six ends with Nausicaa giving um, Odysseus some advice on how to get help. She says, look, I can't exactly go back to the city with you because we are a people of sailors, and you know how sailors love to gossip. If they see me with a strange man, who knows what they're going to say. So I'm going to go on ahead, but you come following on foot, come to the city, ask for where the palace is, and when you get there, go to my mother, Queen Arete, not my father. She says, go to my mother, Queen Arete, bow down before her, and ask her for her help. And... The, the book ends with Odysseus saying, okay, Nausicaa leaves, and Odysseus says, Athena, please help me, bless me, allow me to find aid, and sets out for the palace. And a couple questions to consider about book six. How would you describe Homer's characterization of the women in this book? What do you notice about his understanding 
and his portrayal of women, their behavior, their desires, their thoughts and fears. Um, is it believable? Is it realistic? Is it human? Um, and again, think about this in the context of this story of, of Odysseus's travel. Why is Homer so concerned with the depiction of women? Why do they play such an important role? And what does it say about his depiction of, or how does it characterize Greek society? And what do you make in this book in particular about the focus on modesty and propriety? Odysseus hides his nakedness. Nausicaa um, uh, does not want to be seen with a strange man. What does this reveal about their characters? What does this show us about understandings of the proper relationships between men and women? And what masculinity and femininity meant in Greek culture? And again, thinking about this all as a way of looking at gender as a lens, as a topic for understanding the poem as a whole. So a few final questions, again, what do we notice about the role gender plays in this story? How important are women and in what ways and why are they important? Is their role surprising in any way? The way that women behave, are we surprised by their behavior, by their desires, by the way Homer characterizes them? And again, is it believable? Is it human? What are the most important virtues on display throughout these first six books? How do the characters display their goodness, their heroism, their worthiness? We might also consider the contrast. How do the characters that are less admirable display their wickedness or their poor qualities, their poor morals? And how do the gods and humans interact? What do we see about their interactions? How the gods affect the humans? Um, how are they characterized? What does this tell us again about if the gods here are not necessarily um, you know, meant to be taken literally, but instead are metaphorical, are figures for the Greek understanding of the way the world works, what is this showing us about Greek thought and Greek ideology? Um, are these gods blameless or above criticism or are they flawed? I've already sort of said they're flawed, but in what ways are they flawed? And is it true, as Zeus says, that humans are the cause of all their own problems. Another way to put this is, in what way are the gods to blame for all the bad things that happen? Just a few final comments. Um, after you've watched this, make sure that if you haven't already read books one through six, that you do so. Um, if you have already read them, I advise you to go back and reread them, or at least uh, go over the most important sections. Uh, the online quiz on these lectures and on the first six books is due Wednesday the 19th. On an earlier lecture, I said the 18th, but it's actually Wednesday the 19th. And then in the second half of this week, you'll read books 7 through 12. You'll um, watch the lecture on those books. And there's an online quiz due at the end of the week on Friday. And of course, your reading journal also due at the end of the week on Friday. Um, if you have any questions about this or any of the other assignments, about any of the content or ideas in this lecture, about anything in your reading, you know how to contact me via phone, text, email, or Blackboard. And with that, I wish you all good sailing um, and good luck on your work this week.